In the last 14 days, we've seen God do some pretty amazing things at Camp Cherokee. I mean, crazy, crazy things. Words do not describe, cannot describe the movement of God that we've experienced in our church and our student ministry over the last 14 days. Now, I can shoot off a bunch of numbers, but I want you to understand that every single number that you hear represents a person, a person that's either going to go to heaven or hell someday. And I can tell you out of 980 students that were a part of this, this week, this past two weeks of camp, we saw 196 people make a spiritual decision for Jesus Christ. 196 individuals. Praise the Lord. And out of that, 98 people have been baptized. 98 people have been baptized, raising their flag for Jesus, saying, I'm going all in with Christ. It's an amazing thing to see what God has done. I had the privilege of being at all three of our camps and uh, speaking at all three of them on a morning session, but also attending the evenings. And I just want to tell you what I experienced at Camp Cherokee. I experienced, as I observed our students, just a movement of God. I, I experienced in incredible things. I saw students on their face at the altar begging God to show up. I saw tears that were being shed, shed flowing as, as students were praying for lost friends to come to know Jesus, praying for family members that they know don't have a relationship with the Lord. I heard cries of repentance. I heard cries of confession. I saw students boldly give their life to the Lord in front of everybody with all heads up and no heads bowed. I mean, one of those like, I'm going all in. I don't care who knows about it. I saw students boldly extending their their hands in praise. In fact, in the middle camp, y'all wouldn't even stay on the ground. They were standing up on their chair, praising God with their hands extended in praise because they just wanted God to show up. They wanted more of what God was doing and they wanted to sense and experience the presence of Almighty God and they did it. God showed up in an incredible way and I, as an observer, got to see some pretty amazing things, some supernatural things, some things that had the glimpse of revival. And I don't know about you, church. I want that. I want to experience revival. And revival normally doesn't start with a group of people. It starts in us. It starts within who we are. And we've got to decide if we want to press into Jesus and get to experience what they've been experiencing for a couple of weeks in a very real way. Can we just stop and celebrate what God has done over these last 14 days and just praise him? Listen, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. If you've ever been to church camp, there's a good chance you've experienced some kind of camp high. And that's kind of what we're talking about, right? It's those moments that are different than every other moment. The moment where you're, it's like you and God are in the same room and y'all are talking. Like you can feel him, you can see him, you can smell him. It's like you and God are like this, right? It's a camp high. If you've ever been to a men's conference or a women's retreat or a weekend marriage event, you've probably sensed a little bit of what I'm talking about today. But when you get to experience one of those monumental moments where it's, it's you and the Lord and God is doing some incredible things, it's almost like one of those events that, it's like a spiritual drug that affects you. It's a drug that affects you neurologically and spiritually and emotionally, and it feels like you're connected to the Lord in a sense. And I want you to understand that that camp high that I'm talking about, that intimate moment with the Lord that I'm describing, it typically happens when we deliberately disconnect from the world and when we intentionally connect with the Lord. It, it, it doesn't just happen by chance. It happens when we take a couple of steps of faith, when we disconnect from the world, when we connect with the Lord. You, you know, it's pretty amazing what God can do when you leave your cell phone at home. It's pretty amazing what, what can happen if we stop thinking about things that don't really matter. And all of a sudden we have a little season of time where we're not worried about, uh, we're not worried about what's going on at work. We're not worried about what's going on at school. We're not worried about our home life, our friend life. We're not focused on our Facebook accounts, our Insta story, or playing, playing video games with our friends. We're not worried about playing fork knife with our friends, right? I know what it's called. I'm just kidding. But anyways. <laughs> but it's pretty cool to see what happens when you disconnect from the world and you intentionally press into Jesus and you say, God, I want to feel you. I want to see you. I want to experience you in a real way. And we saturate our mind in the word of God for a week at camp in the middle of the woods. And we press into Jesus and his word and we talk about him and we learn about him and we, we talk to him, understanding that he listens to us and he responds to us. I remember for me, it was my junior year of high school. I went to a beach camp in Panama City Beach. 
And I'll just be very honest with you. I didn't go to that camp intending to meet with Jesus. I wasn't trying to connect with Jesus at that camp. I was trying to connect a whole lot of other things like the beach, like my friends, like other things. You know, I'm, I'm thinking like a, a 17 year old boy thinks, but I, I ended up connecting with Jesus in a very powerful way. And to this day, I can remember that moment. It was unlike any other moment in my Christian walk. It was the first time in my life I felt like it was just me and the Lord in the room. There were hundreds of teenagers, but it was as if the speaker was communicating a message straight from the Lord to my heart. The band was playing songs that I needed to sing to the Lord. I needed to raise my hands and declare some things to the Lord. And that moment was that moment for me. It was that mountaintop, monumental, spiritual moment in my life. And that was the moment where God called me into ministry. That was the moment where he clearly said, I've got a plan for your life, and I'm calling you to surrender some things to me. And I can remember that moment as if it were yesterday. In fact, I wish that moment would never even end. It's that moment where you're so connected to the Lord, and you are pressed into him, and you want it to last forever. You want to recreate it over and over again. May I ask you a question? Have you ever experienced that kind of moment with the Lord? Just shake your head if you have. I'm just curious to see how many of us have experienced something like that. See, there are numerous mountaintop moments all throughout the pages of Scripture. But today, I don't want us to talk about how to live on top of the mountain. In fact, what I'd like for us to do this morning is to open up the pages of God's Word in Hebrews chapter 12, and we are going to have a conversation that looks a little bit different. You see, as you look at the mountaintop moments throughout the pages of the Scripture, what you're going to discover is this. Nearly every single mountaintop moment in Scripture is coupled with a valley experience. Mountaintop moments lead to valley experiences. I mean, you look at the Scriptures, every, every Red Sea crossing has years of wilderness wandering. Just look at the life of Moses. For every promotion, there is time spent in bondage. Let's look at the life of Joseph. For every moment of restoration, there's years of heartache and wandering. Just look at the life of Job. For every day of Pentecost, there are years of persecution and years of rejection. Just look at the story of the early church in the book of Acts. In other words, I want us to see from God's word that spiritual highs are awesome. What we've experienced with the Lord, those moments that we'll never forget, they're incredible moments. But those spiritually high moments aren't, are meant to supplement our faith journey not lead our faith journey. Sometimes we come away from a spiritual high like we've experienced over the last couple of weeks and we miss out on that reality. And what happens is we get back to the normal routines in life and we start to encounter obstacles and weights that hinder us from doing what we thought we were gonna do when we got back home or got back to school or got back to work. And as a result, we get discouraged and we give up and we go back to living the same way that we were living prior to that moment with the Lord, prior to that, that moment in time where God spoke life into who we were in the light. And for some of us, we, we go from the mountaintop to the valley and it's like we live the rest of our life trying to recreate that moment. We try to recreate the day of Pentecost, right? We try to recreate that spiritually high feeling or emotion or experience that we had back at camp or back wherever we were when we were meeting with the Lord. But you see, unfortunately, the Bible shows for every one of us that have been on top of the mountain, we are going to end up back in the valley. Greg Speck said, enjoy the retreat, mission trip, and spiritual high, but don't expect it to last. Determine that you are going to follow Jesus Christ no matter how you feel. Did you get that? No matter how you feel. I say all of this to set this up. You ready? If you're on top of the mountain, praise God for the mountaintop. Praise him. There's nothing wrong with the mountaintop. Praise him for it. But get ready. Because the Bible says that the valley is coming. And those valleys bring obstacles and those valleys bring challenges that lead us to discouragement and disappointment if we aren't prepared for the valley. And so this morning, if you're taking notes, I hope you are, we're asking this question, how can I prepare for the valley? I'm coming off of a mountain, but how can I prepare for the valley that is promised ahead of me? The writer of Hebrews is going to give us some great instruction today out of Hebrews chapter 12. And this is what he's going to tell us right off the bat. You ready? He's going to say, run your race with endurance. 
Run your race with endurance. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. Now, you probably realize that this passage immediately follows the great hall of faith passage in Hebrews chapter 11. And now Paul is pointing to these people that he calls a large cloud of witnesses. And he's saying, do you want to, do you want to win this race? If you want to win this race, if you want to endure to the end, here's what you got to do. You have to run with endurance. You have to press in. You have to press on. You have to run this race with endurance, and you've got to have faith like these people had faith. And he's pointing to this large cloud of witnesses. Now, they're called witnesses for two different reasons. The first reason they're called witnesses is because they bore witness for Christ in their own faith. They bore witness for Christ. John MacArthur said they are witnesses of God, not to us. They are first witnesses of God. But the second reason that these people are called witnesses is because these individuals have a general sense of what a modern day believer is facing as we run this race called life, run this Christian life. They get it. And so the Bible points to them almost as cheerleaders cheering us on as we run this race. They're cheering us on, understanding what we're facing. So Paul says, I want you to run like Abel. I want you to run like Noah or Abraham. I want you to run like Sarah or Isaac. I want you to run like Moses. In fact, I want you to run this race like Jesus ran this race. He said, look to those who've gone before you and those who've ran well. But then he goes on to say this, and let us lay aside every hindrance. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily entangles us. At the time this was written in the first century, running was a really big deal. In fact, today you can go to the Holy Land and you can see several different arenas where sporting events were taking place even in the first century. But running was a premier event back in these days. It was the grand finale, the thing that everybody wanted to see. Who's going to win the big race? And historians give us all kinds of documentation of what these events must have been like. In fact, it says that runners in these days would run the race nearly naked. But that's not how they entered the arena. Historians say they would enter the arena wearing these long, beautiful, colorful, flowing gowns, these robes that had all kinds of different symbols and colors. But as, as the arena would announce their name and once they would wave to the crowd, right before the race would be run, they would take off their robe and they would lay it aside so that they could run the race nearly naked to the best of their ability. They would run nearly naked. The author of Hebrews uses this analogy to challenge us as believers, and here's what he's going to say. He's going to say, we all, all of us, have things in our lives that shouldn't be there. We all have sin in our lives that prevent us from running this race in a way that God intended for us to run. So Paul says, we've got to identify those things. What are they? The things that entangle us, the ones, the ones that trip us up and, and prevent us from running well. And he tells us, once you identify what those are, make the decision, the cognitive decision, to remove those things from your life and lay them aside. You can't run the race in your robe. You can't run the race until you discard the things that have no business being a part of your race. And he says, once you take those things off, then you have a chance. Let me ask you a question. What are those things in your life? What are the things that trip you up? What are the sin things in your life that have no business being there? The things that are preventing you from being maximized for the kingdom of God? What are the things that are, are, are preventing you from winning? The things that are, are, causing, are, are causing you to stumble over and over again. You know what he tells you? Very practically speaking, he said, take them off. Take those things off and lay them aside. You say, how am I supposed to do that? Read verse 2. He said, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Here it is. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. 
So this says, when the valley begins, when the struggle of the race begins, keep your eyes on Jesus and remember what he endured for you. He is the source and the perfecter of our faith. You say, what happens when we do that? Check out verse three. He said, you won't grow weary and give up. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, you won't grow weary and give up. He said, when you're struggling in the race, have you ever done that before? You're running and your side starts to hurt. You ever been there? He he said, in life, when you get to that point where your side starts to hurt, and you feel like you're about to yak all over the place, right? I mean, the the time in the race where you feel like, I can't take one more step or I'm gonna drop right here and die. He said, in that moment, keep your eyes on those who've gone before you and keep your eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of your faith. He said, that'll allow you to do it. That'll allow you to go. He said, run your race with endurance. But secondly, I want you to see, he tells us to run your race with discipline. Run your race with with discipline. I'm going to be very honest with you today. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and make a confession. I am not a runner. I know it's hard to imagine. I'm not a runner at all. In fact, I hate running. I'm not going to run voluntarily unless something big is chasing me and I'm very, very scared. But the real reason I'm not a runner is because I lack the passion and I lack the discipline that it takes to be a great runner. I don't have what it takes to be a great runner. In fact, I read an article just this week that said, this is, the, this is the recipe of a great runner, and it listed two ingredients. It said you have to have discipline and you have to have consistency. Discipline and consistency. And then it went on to talk about what these things look like. It started out with consistency. It said you have to be consistent in a couple of different things. First of all, you have to start waking up before 4 o'clock in the morning. What? I'm out. You have to be consistent. So they said, you have to do that. And then you need to get into a routine where you're running at least eight miles a day before you take your shower, before you go to work. I'm out once again. So that's consistency. Secondly, it gives you all these things that you have to be disciplined in. One of them, it said, you have to work out for an hour and a half a day, six to seven days a week. Not a chance. The second thing you have to be disciplined at, it said you basically have to have the same diet as a rabbit. And I'm not doing it. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it. And so I looked at that and I was like, listen, I don't have what it takes. I don't have the desire and I don't have the passion. In fact, I've never looked at a marathon runner and thought to myself, you know what? I just really want to be like them. And if you're a marathon runner, I apologize. I just haven't had that thought. I've never thought I really want to do what they're doing. I want to be just like them. But here's the crazy thing. In this text, what he's saying is this. We as believers should look at the people who've who've gone before us, the ones who've run the race very, very well, and we should automatically think, I want to be like them. I want to run the race that they have run. Do you get the difference? He said, you've got to look at those who've gone before you, and you have to do what they have done. You have to pursue the same things they pursued. You have to run to Jesus like they run, run to Jesus. And he said, then you can be a great runner. The problem with this is many people hear that today. And they say, I can't be a great runner. I can't do what God's called me to do. I can't make a difference for the kingdom of God. It's because I have too many issues. It's because I've blown it too many times. My my resume of sinfulness is beyond anyone else in this room. I am too far gone. I am too old. It's too late for me to start over and run to Jesus. If you just saw my circumstances, you would say, they're way too grim. God could definitely not use them. There's a lot of people who feel like that today. I'm too far gone and God can't use me. But if that's you today, can I just hear you? Can you just hear me say this? When you overestimate your problems, you underestimate our God. When you look at your problems and say, my problems are too big. And then you look at your God and you say, but my God is too small. You're blowing it. You're wrong. God is so much bigger than your problems. And he can take anybody in this room, anybody in this world and do great things. You included. You have the ability to run this race and to run it well. You, if you know Christ, you have the power to run with persistence. You may be in a valley right now, but you need to hear this. You can run the race if you decide to run. You can do it. Say, how do I do that? Goes back to those ingredients. Discipline and consistency and the power of Almighty God. That's how you can do it. We've got to run with endurance. We have to be disciplined. When we're on the mountaintop, 
We've got to be there. And when we're in the valley, we definitely have to be there. In verse 7, he goes on to give us some difficult instruction. This is the part that none of us want to hear. You ready? He says, endure suffering as discipline. Endure suffering as discipline. Let me tell you what that means. It means you're going to suffer. But the suffering in your life is designed to make you better. That's what the Bible says. Billy Graham said, the Christian life is not a constant high. I have moments of deep discouragement. I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, oh God, forgive me or help me. So with that being said, can I just say it this way? If Billy Graham wasn't exempt from valley experiences in life, then neither are we. We're all going to walk through the valley. And you may not want to hear this today, but I believe that we need those valley experiences in our life. I believe if we're going to become the people that God created us to be, then we need to learn how to endure suffering and grow as human beings. You say, why is that? It's very simple. Listen, growth typically happens in the valley, not on top of the mountain. You look at any mountain range. Where does the growth take place? The valley, man, it is thick. It's got all the trees, all the shrubs, all the growth, the moss, right? It's covered in growth. On the mountaintop, it becomes a little bare. Growth typically happens in the valley, not on top of the mountain. After battling a cancer that nearly took his life, my dad wrote a book about his cancer experience called Through the Valleys. And in this book, he explained how cancer was never something on his bucket list. It wasn't something he signed up for. It wasn't something he asked for or thought would be a good thing. But then he goes on to talk about how God used that season in his life to teach him things that he would have never learned otherwise. He identified the areas of growth that happened in his life as he walked through that valley experience. That growth would have never taken place if he would have remained on, the, on top of the mountain. And I think all of us could echo that in one way or another. It's true. I mean, think about the mountain range. The growth happens in the valley. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is telling us as believers. In verse 7, he says, endure suffering as discipline. He's saying it's there to grow you. He goes on to say, God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them, but he does it for our benefit so that we can share in his holiness. Now, let's stop there for a second. I want you to look at the first part of that passage there and understand that God's discipline in your life is a sign of grace that communicates you are his child. I mean, that's an amazing thought. That's what it just said. Look, it said, but if you are without discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Here's the thing. Parents don't discipline kids that don't belong to them. Some of you do. I get that, all right? I've had a few people growing up grab my ear in Walmart, all right? But most people don't discipline children that don't belong to them. And that's what it's saying here. It's saying, are you being disciplined right now? Are you in a valley right now? Then, man, let that be a sign that reminds you. It's a, a sign of grace that communicates, I'm a child of God. God is using this season to grow me as his child. I love the picture that it paints here in verse 10. It, he makes the point that parents discipline their children, but only for a little while. But there's a point where that child grows up and leaves the house and moves beyond the realm of their parents' discipline. But he says that here, God never finishes disciplining us. I don't care if you're 100 years old, God is still disciplining you and he does it your entire life in order to make us more like himself. Do you see that? God disciplines us to make us more like Jesus. He does it to make us holy. As parents, we mess up all the time. Don't we? Parents, shake your head, right? I know I do. Listen, I mess up all the time, especially when it comes to disciplining my kids. There are moments in, in my life, in my experience, where I respond way too harshly. I respond way too quickly. I react in ways that are way too strong when it comes to disciplining my children. And let me tell you what normally happens next. 
After that happens, after I blow it as a dad trying to discipline my kids, I then have to circle up in front of my kids and I have to ask them to forgive me. That's when I get before my kids and I'm like, listen, I responded too harshly. I shouldn't have done that. I was way too quick in my response. I apologize for that. I need you to forgive me. I'm apologizing because I blew it and I need you to forgive me. That's what happens when we mess up with our kids. But may I just share something with you? God never messes up. He never messes up in the way that he parents us. He never messes up in the way he shepherds us. He never has to say, I'm sorry, I blew it. I responded too harshly. I responded too quickly. I was wrong. God doesn't have regrets in the way that he shepherds us. And the reason I can say that is because he's God and he's perfect. And he knows way better than we know of what it's going to take to grow us up and to mature us and to make us look more like Jesus in order to put us on a pathway that leads to holiness. You see, the Bible says he parents us for our good, and I quote, so that we can share his holiness. Many years ago, I read a statement in my dad's book that changed the way that I look at valley experiences. When he realized what he was facing, he came to the realization that says nothing can get to me unless it first goes through God. And I want you to personalize this today. Those of you who are in the valley right now, those of you who are walking in darkness right now, those of you who are looking up at God saying, are you really going to, is this really going to be my trajectory right now? Is this where you're going to make me go? And I want you to personalize this. Nothing can get to you unless it first goes through God. God may not have created the valley that you're in, but he certainly allowed it. He's allowed it. And what that tells me is that God must believe that I can endure this season that I'm going through. He must believe that I am capable of walking through this valley in his power, in his protection, with his provision. I can make it. So wherever you're at, listen, if you're in a valley today, if you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, here's the thing. He knows about your valley and he said you can make it. Press into him. Trust him. That's what he says. Hebrews 12, 7, endure suffering as discipline. What that means is I'm not just suffering, I'm growing. I'm not just suffering, I'm maturing. I'm not just suffering, I'm becoming more like Jesus. I'm not just suffering, I'm pursuing the holiness of Almighty God, right? I'm on the path that he put me on. He didn't abandon me. He didn't leave me. He's with me. He's for me. And he said, I'm a trustworthy God. We got to believe Romans 8, 28. That says all things, look at it, all things, even bad things, even scary things, all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Paul just said, endure suffering as discipline so that we can share his holiness. Let's keep going. Verse 11. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time. How many of y'all ever got a spanking and just said, ah, this is great? (laughs) Me either. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That word discipline, when you look that word up in the original language, it actually speaks of athletic conditioning. So when I see that word discipline in my Bible, I've got flashbacks to off-season football. And I'm remembering the days when we had a terrible team and we had two-a-day practices, three-a-day practices, and we were absolutely miserable. Out there every single day, Enduring the 105 degree West Texas sunshine. And then I think about the reason that we did that in the first place. See, the reason we were willing to endure difficult days, the reason that we were willing to to get on a field with other teenage boys that are running and spitting and throwing up and just trying to make it for one more day is because at the end of the day, we wanted to win. At the end of the season, we wanted to be on the top. Someday, we wanted to be able to look back and say, you know what? We experienced victory. We want to be victorious, don't we? 
That's what the word discipline means. Discipline means it's painful in the moment. But in the end, it makes us better. It's difficult in the season. But at the end, we can be victorious. Tom Landry, legendary coach of the Dallas Cowboys, once said this. He said, the job of a coach is to make players do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. And I want you to hear me say this. That's exactly what God wants to do in our lives. We just got off the mountaintop, Camp Cherokee. Here's what I want you to know. God wants to use that mountaintop moment in your life to build you up, to encourage you, to put some wind in your sails, to get you fired up for Jesus. He wants to use that mountaintop moment to build you up. But those of us in the valley, God wants to use that season in your life to grow you up. He builds us up. He grows us up so that ultimately we can become the man of God, the woman of God that God created us to be. He uses the highs and he uses the lows. And you know what? He said, in both the high and the low, I'm a good God. I'm a trustworthy God. I'm a God who's for you. I use this to build you up. I use this to make you more like Jesus as we pursue the holiness of God. And at the end, we can become the holiness of God. We can pursue the holiness of God and we can become more like Christ as a result. But here's the thing. Just remember that he is present in both the highs and the lows. Remember that he allows both to happen for your good, for his glory. And he is ever present. Where are you today? Maybe you would say, I'm on top of the mountain and everything is great in my life. Or perhaps you are in the middle of a valley experience and you can't even explain the darkness around you. Can I just encourage you with the fact that God is with you today? Whether you're up high or whether you're down low, he's with you and he knows exactly what you're going through. Thank you for joining our broadcast today. We love hearing about how God is speaking to your heart and what he's doing in you and through you. We'd love for you to stay connected to us. You could check us out online at the website or you can connect with us on social media. We're already looking forward to this time next week as you tune in and we get to open up God's word once again in the summer camp series. God bless you. Have a great day.